into Academic Half Day this morning. Um, the third hour of our morning today is going to be split into uh, senior and intern only sessions with Mega Report. Um, but we'll start off with Mixap Oncology today, and I'll turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Adam Johnson. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for spending part of your Thursday uh, with me today. Um, my name's Adam. I'm a, a hospitalist at the VA, uh, and um, yeah, that's kind of my story. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to be uh, joined by Dr. Seng, and I'll have her introduce herself. Nice to meet you, by the way. Hi, nice to meet you, Adam. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for um, Emily and the leadership for the opportunity to present. Um, so I'm one of the oncologists. Uh, I specialize in thoracic and head and neck. Um, I recently just joined last year, so I'm relatively new to Seattle. I'm from California. And I look forward to participating today. And just want to thank Adam for all his hard work, you know, putting together this slide deck and you put a lot of thought into these questions. So we really hope you enjoy, you guys enjoy the session. Oh, great. Uh, so thanks uh, again. So, um, you know, it, it mix up, what is it, uh, just to get everybody on the same page, uh, medical knowledge self-assessment program. Uh, you can pay as an attending a uh, thousand bucks uh, for this book um, and uh, a bunch of other books like it and an app. Um, and uh, it's well worth uh, the money if you are uh, kind of a QBank type person like me. Um, but we're just going to go through just a teeny tiny fraction of uh, what's in that book uh, today, mostly covering uh, broad topics. So um, my hope for today is just understand the questions question. You know, questions can go in 15 different directions based on their STEM. Um, and so how do you kind of approach it? Um, we'll just go over that briefly. Uh, I think high yield topics are, um, are super important in this and uh, specifically a lot of the inpatient stuff that we see all the time because a lot of our inpatient rotations uh, expose us to this. Um, uh, we're not going to focus on too much. So sorry, oncologic emergencies. Uh, we're going to be more kind of tumor board like, how do we stage this? How do we treat things based on staging? So uh, you may not love it as much, but this is stuff that you need to know. <laughs> so um, it's okay if you get things wrong. All right, so we'll just jump in here. Um, I will, I, uh, Courtney, I hear there's a kind of Zoom person behind the curtain who's going to be making polling open. So thank you for, for that. Um, all right, so jumping in, a 65 year old guy evaluated for an episode of hemoptysis. His past medical history is significant for a 30-pack year history of smoking. Quit smoking a year ago. He takes no medications on physical exam. Vital signs are normal. BMI is 28. Oxygen saturation is 96% uh, on ambient air. Uh, the hard work's been done for you. CT scan uh, of the chest identifies a three and a half centimeter spiculated mass in the right lower lobe and an enlarged uh, hilar lymph node. PET CT uh, and brain MRI scans show no evidence of metastatic disease. And surgeries performed, which reveals a 3.2 centimeter poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with negative margins. Two hilar lymph nodes, um, a positive from metastatic adenocarcinoma and negative mediastinal lymph nodes. Uh, so I'll ask you the question and then I'll come back to the stem. So the question here is which of the following is the most appropriate management? Adjuvant chemoradiation, adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant radiation, or observation. Uh, so you got your uh, poll there. I'm gonna pull it out of my screen. Uh, so we'll give you a, a few seconds here to come up with your answer. So we'll go back a slide. We're at about 50% right now, so we'll give another 10 seconds for people to select. All right. Well, you guys answered much like people who took the boards did. Uh, so the answer here is adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Uh, wow, that breakdown is so close. Uh, great. Uh, so just to, the, what's the question asking? Uh, and so just the first section is, uh, you're, you're really teeing it up for a question about lung cancer. So this could be uh, anything from uh, 
primary care, preventative screening, uh, get a low dose chest CT uh, to, um, well, he has hemoptysis, so that's a different story. But uh, just know that we're, you're probably dealing with lung cancer. Uh, and then, you know, the, the big takeaways here uh, are highlighted in red. Uh, so the size historically mattered. Um, uh, the fact that it is a, a cancer, uh, the fact that it has negative margins with hyalur lymph nodes without mediastinal lymph nodes, um, stages this at a stage two non-smell cell lung cancer, which is treated with adjuvant chemo after you take it out. Uh, so let's just go through uh, the stages of lung cancer and what the boards wants you to know. Uh, so stage one, uh, the buzzword here is no lymph nodes. Uh, single uh, mass, that's biopsy proven, uh, you just cut it out. Um, uh, for stage two, uh, the, the buzzword here is, is hyalur lymphadenopathy. Uh, and after you cut it out, uh, cisplatin is the, um, is the treatment of choice. Uh, Mixup wants you to know that cisplatin is superior to carboplatin. Uh, sometimes they get into the weeds a little bit, um, but uh, just remember cisplatin with uh, hyalur lymph nodes. Uh, stage three uh, is, uh, the buzzword here is uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Uh, technically, mediastine, uh, resection of mediastinal lymph nodes is, um, is trickier and not as effective. Uh, and so uh, in that case, surgery is uh, typically not indicated. Uh, and uh, the takeaway here is uh, chemo and XRT plus immunotherapy is, is, your, um, is the way to go. Uh, and then stage four, uh, if you have distant METs uh, in other places. Um, uh, the boards is always very uh, kind of geriatric, uh, less is more, um, uh, don't intervene if you don't have to. Uh, and so this is ripe for uh, palliative care consultation as this has a, a mortality benefit. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, there are seven genes that are tested. Uh, the ones the boards really wants you to know is EGFR uh, has a specific uh, targeted uh, therapy with erlotinib. Uh, ALK and ROS2, crizotinib, uh, and then PDL1, uh, pembrolizumab, and nivolumab. Um, and if you're negative for all of those driving mutations, uh, platinum based or cisplatin plus immunotherapy is, is the way to go. Um, as a uh, lung cancer specialist, Dr. Sang, is there anything else you want to add to? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, this might be a good place for me to go ahead and jump in. Um, so I guess to start off, uh, I really like the way you talked about, um, you know, some of the test taking skills and really honing in on what is the um, question asking. I think that's incredibly important, um, especially for all questions. Um, so right off the bat, this, um, this is a question about treatment. And I actually, when I take these kinds of tests, because I, I, I've taken the medicine and the onc boards, not... Uh, not too long ago, I should say, um, is I actually like to read the question first. And that way my brain, like I don't waste brain space reading through the long paragraph and I kind of know what to focus on. Um, so right off, so I usually read the question first and I think, okay, this is a treatment question. It's not a question about side effects. It's not a question about, you know, communication. It's about treatment. Um, and so, and then I, I read the question with that in mind. Um, this question in particular, as Adam has alluded to, is actually a two-step question, right? So number one, you need to be able to dissect the question to figure out what's the stage. And then number two, you have to go from stage to treatment. So I think recognizing that, you know, you're going to have to take those two steps to get at the answer um, is incredibly important. Um, the second sort of test-taking point that um, you know, uh, I want to emphasize here is that it's really important to have a framework for getting to the right answer. Um, and what Adam is presenting here is a really nice framework for thinking about the relationship between how to get from stage to treatment. Um, and I would encourage you to, to really develop these frameworks. Um, and I think we'll go through a couple examples of that through the questions. But I think by taking advantage of your framework, what you can do is you can learn the rules and then you can learn the exceptions. And I think by thinking about um, oncology or action, a lot of your mix-up questions that way, I think, at least for me, it helps me from getting overwhelmed with like information overload, you know, and it kind of reduces the things you need to memorize into a few key concepts. 
Um, so going back to this question here, um, you know, I think this is a really nice and simple framework for thinking about stage is, um, you know, at the, you know, at the end of the day, the, the size matters, the, the, the nodes matter, but really if you just think about the lymph node status, that'll really help simplify things. So if there are no lymph nodes involved, you're stage one. If you're, you have hyalur lymph nodes involved, basically that hyalur, I would just think of the lymph nodes that are on the same side as the tumor. That gives you a stage two. If you've got lymph nodes that are in the middle of your chest now, those are your mediastinal lymph nodes and those get you to a stage three. And then if the cancers move anywhere else outside the thorax, then we're talking about a stage four cancer. Um, so um, kind of elaborating on this a little bit more. Um, so for stage one cancer, really standard of care is surgery. So that's the rule. Now, the exception is, let's say you've got a, you know, a veteran who's on oxygen, he's got you know, um, someone coming to help him you know, for uh, you know, uh, several days out of the week. He may not be a surgical candidate, so that's the exception, is you know, he might be someone treated with radiation instead. Uh, now, moving on to stage two, um, the, you know, the, the standard of care here is uh, surgery followed by uh, adjuvant radiation, uh, sorry, adjuvant chemotherapy. And that's really where, what this question um, is focused on. The reality is in on clinic, there's like nuance and, you know, the adjuvant chemotherapy is actually giving you about a 5% increased chance of survival. And so it's actually a shared decision and it's not that straightforward. But remember for the boards, it's, you know, they're not going to be asking about things that are controversial. They're going to ask about things that are really straightforward. So they just pick the answer, which is adjuvant chemo. Um, I see there's a question in the chat, which is, what stage if supraclavicular lymph nodes? Is that a stage four or not? So that's actually an excellent question. Um, I didn't cover that. So the supraclav lymph nodes are actually at N3, um, and that actually gets you to stage 3C. So not quite a stage four, but it's one of these, you know, advanced stage three, borderline stage four situations. Um, and for those patients, it's actually a sheer decision between whether you're gonna go with chemo XRT or um, you know, if you've got an elderly patient more palliative route. Um, so getting back to the stage, uh, stage two, the, 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 the other uh, thing I wanna mention here is in the question stem, uh, it noted that the patient did not have any um, positive margins. If the question were different and the patient has surgical margins, then the answer would have been adjuvant chemo radiation. Um, now moving on to stage three, I agree, you know, standard of care now is chemo XRT followed by uh, a year of uh, dervalumab. Um, and then for stage four, um, you know, really I think the framework is thinking about, do they have a molecular driver? If yes, then you use a targeted therapy. Um, I think one update I have to the slide here is that the first line treatment for each of our mutant cancers is osimertinib. That's a recent change in the standard of care. Um, Erlotinib is an earlier generation uh, drug. Um, and if they don't have a molecular uh, in alteration, then it's immunotherapy plus or minus chemo. I just wanna make sure I was doing okay on time. Awesome. That's great. Uh, any additional questions uh, from the crowd? I see there's a question. Do, so do we only think about gen genetic mutations of stage four? Um, so that's a great question. Um, I think uh, you, know, you guys are probably very up, up to date on the literature. So until last year, yes, you, know, you only cared about the molecular status if the patient was stage four. However, um, and just last year, there was a clinical trial um, that was performed for testing erlotinib in the adjuvant setting after surgery for patients with stage uh, 1B to stage 3 disease. So that's actually a very recent change in the standard of care. So now EGFR testing is indicated for patients with stage 1B to stage 3. All right, awesome. Um, move on to number two. Uh, let's see. 
I didn't quite do that right. Uh, so again, a couple different ways that uh, the question stem could change um, and a couple different things you could see. Okay, uh, question two, a 49 year old man uh, evaluated for a one month history of a painless enlarging left neck mass. His medical history is unremarkable. He takes no medications. On physical exam, vital signs are normal. BMI is 26. On palpation, there's a two centimeter left anterior cervical lymph node near the angle of the mandible. Uh, laryngoscopy shows a left-sided uh, tonsil cancer. Uh, biopsy of the tonsil reveals moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma that's positive for P16 or HPV. CT of the neck reveals a left-sided cervical lymph node. A left tonsil mass is noted. CT scan of the chest is negative. <clears throat> uh, Post-operative pathology reveals a 2.5 centimeter tonsil cancer with negative margins and three out of 26 positive cervical nodes, one with extra capsular extension. All right, so another one of these uh, two level questions, uh, second level questions, which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? Cisplatin alone, cisplatin plus HPV vaccine, cisplatin plus radiation or radiation alone. Same thing, we're right around 50%. So I'll give another 10 seconds and then I'll close the poll. All right, so cisplatin plus radiation uh, and that is uh, right. Uh, so again, the, the breakdown is just so incredible uh you guys are following it almost right. seems rigged you know <laughs> i know right it's like <laughs> uh so great uh cisplatin plus radiation so let's talk about this so uh the question here is uh this patient is is a young guy with a neck mass uh and he has locally advanced head and neck cancer uh and the treatment for that is uh combined chemo and radiation so a, a few pearls uh for this uh is that once you have uh the the, the diagnosis here of a squamous cell carcinoma uh in head and neck cancers, MRIs and PET CTs are helpful uh, for staging. Uh, HPV portends a good prognosis in these patients. Uh, and for localized disease, surgery is the mainstay, uh, upfront surgery uh, is the mainstay of treatment. And then uh, for uh, folks who have a very high risk of recurrence, uh, chemo and XRT is, uh, is recommended. So uh, the, the buzzwords that you'll see are extra capsular extension, positive margins, uh, and then when you hear that, uh, think cisplatin and radiation. Uh, for distant disease, again, platinum-based uh, chemo, <coughs> uh, uh, 5-FU and uh, pembrolizumab. Uh, one, one key thing here uh, is that uh, they, they mentioned a laryngoscopy, but they specifically said that this was a tonsil cancer. Uh, and so I, I want to separate head and neck cancers that uh, are not laryngeal cancer, so uh, tonsillar cancer, oral cancer, uh, tongue cancer, those types of things uh, from laryngeal cancer, because there's a huge uh, quality of life uh, problem, if you will, in folks who have laryngeal cancer who undergo surgery. Uh, if you have laryngeal cancer and you cut it out, uh, the person can't uh, talk, uh, and that uh, has a big quality of life implications. And so uh, for those folks, uh, there's a focus now on uh, uh, with uh, uh, laryngeal preservation. Uh, and by doing so, uh, you try to just get away with XRT if you're able to, or uh, laryngeal preservation uh, surgery. Uh, once it starts to get more advanced, uh, then you do uh, deeper surgeries, if you will, uh, with, with chemo and XRT. Uh, and then it's really the very advanced laryngeal cancers that uh, you do a total laryngectomy um, and then add on chemo and XRT. Uh, and again, Dr. Sang, this is uh, your wheelhouse for sure. <laughs> um, anything else to add on? All right, yeah, so this, I guess my cue to chime in. Um, so, you know, I, I really like that framework, Adam, that you, you bring up here about separating laryngeal cancer from the other cancers. So, um, you know, analogous to how in 
lung cancer staging, we had the framework of where, which lymph nodes are involved and in how you think about staging. Your framework in head and neck cancer is gonna be about anatomy. Okay, so where is the primary? Sometimes you don't know, and it's a primary of unknown origin. That's something different, right? Some patients will just present with a neck mass. You'll never find where they're primary. But when you think about um, the, you know, this disease, think about the anatomy. And when I think, think about it, I think about oral cavity, and that's basically anything in the anterior two-thirds of your tongue. I think about oral pharynx, stuff in the back of your mouth. I think about hypopharynx, which is the uh, area between the back of your mouth and where your larynx is, and then, you think, then I think about larynx. We actually separate larynx into two other, you know, the top and bottom part, but for the purposes, um, you know, think about anatomy. Um, it's, this is important because, um, so the HPV status, um, you know, is relevant uh, mainly to oral pharynx cancer. You know, so if they're asking you about HPV testing for the other stuff, it's not that relevant. Um, however, for oral pharynx cancer, HPV positive uh, tumors tend to do very well. This is actually very important because this has been a very, you know, uh, a change in the paradigm of how we think about um, prognostication of these kinds of cancers. The other thing that's important to, to remember when you're reading question stems is that, um, you know, sometimes you'll say P16 positive or P16 negative. That's a code word for HPV positive or HPV negative, because um, it turns out that HPV in situ correlates well with P16 staining. So know that when they insert those buzzwords that you're actually talking about HPV status. Um, the, you know, the, uh, going through the slides here, um, you know, the, the thing to remember about um, when you're thinking about adjuvant treatment. So let's say your patient goes to surgery and you're thinking about adjuvant treatment. It's very important to remember these two risk factors. If they've got positive margins or extracapsular extension, pick adjuvant chemo radiation. You know, if it doesn't have those features, then you do nothing and you observe. In reality, it's not that simple, but for the purpose of the boards, those are the things that you should remember. Um, the next point here is about, uh, for distant disease, uh, platinum and F 5 fu uh, pembrolizumab. Uh, this actually um, was a clinical trial that was designed out of Europe. Um, and this made, uh, chemo immunotherapy kind of like the standard of care. Um, I think this is beyond uh, what you'll need to know for the mix up, but you know, I just want to bring it up because it turns out that infusional 5-FU is not really, uh, you know, it's not really used in practice that much here in, uh, you know, the U.S. So we often will use taxane-based chemos. So know that you may go ahead and pick that answer for the boards, but that's not what we're really doing in clinical practice. Um, and uh, last but not least about larynx cancer, um, I totally agree, you know, it's all about larynx preservation here. Um, and so if, if, you know, if total laryngectomy is indicated, um, you know, usually it's, we're going with chemo XRT if you can, unless you have no other choice, or uh, there's a possibility of doing like a partial laryngectomy that preserves the larynx. All right, uh, seeing no questions in the chat box, uh, we'll go on to number three. Okay, uh, so 55 year old woman uh, evaluated for rectal bleeding and pain with defecation. Uh, that's increased during the last three months. She takes no medications. On physical exam, vital signs are normal. BMI is 19. Rectal exam reveals brown stool sample that is guaiac positive. The remainder of the physical exam is unremarkable. Uh, hemoglobin level is 12.5. Uh, White count platelets LFTs are normal. A colonoscopy to the ileocecal valve identifies a fungating mass eight centimeters from the anal verge and a biopsy specimen shows adenocarcinoma. An MRI of the pelvis shows a non-obstructing tumor invading into the muscularis but not through the full thickness of the rectal wall, making it a T2 lesion. Uh, no abnormal lymph nodes are seen. CT with contrast of the chest and abdomen are normal. So which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? 
uh, chemotherapy, radiation, radiation plus chemo, radiation plus chemo followed by surgery, or surgery. Almost at critical mass. I'll give another five seconds and then close the poll. All right. <clears throat> Surgery. Boom. You guys got it. Uh, you guys are better. Than, work here. <laughs> better than mix up. Way to go. All right. Uh, so again, one of these uh, two-step problems. Uh, you're you're first needing to identify uh, where's the cancer and what's the stage, and then what do you do for that stage of cancer. So uh, we'll go through colorectal cancer here. <clears throat> uh, a couple pictures from a YouTube video that uh, I found uh, helpful. <laughs> um, but I, I think the takeaways for uh, stage one is that you'll hear uh, that uh, there's muscularis involvement. Uh, either that or it will say not full thickness. Uh, so that's a very localized uh, tumor. It's not going through the full thickness of uh, the rectal or uh, colonic wall. Uh, and those uh, can just be taken out. Uh, so uh, the boards, again, wants you to know uh, just to cut these out. You can do kind of minimally invasive uh, endoscopic cutting it out uh, or just remove the section of, um, of the rectum. Uh, <clears throat> stage two uh, is going to be identified as a full thickness uh, invasion, which uh, hasn't gone up to the lymph nodes quite yet, uh, but has gone through the full thickness of the, of the colonic wall. Uh, there, there's a caveat here that uh, Mixap uh, wants to throw at you, and this is uh, really a difficult question because of that. Uh, but if this were just a stage two, um, I, I don't think they'd throw this question, I should be honest. John, you can correct me. but. Uh, I think this is a little too nuanced, but um, rectal cancers uh, are a bit more, uh, we'll call them baddies, if you will, than, than uh, other types of colon cancers. Uh, so rectal cancers, uh, you do chemo, radiation, and surgery uh, to those. Whereas a stage two colon cancer, you can just uh, cut it out uh, and uh, not have any additional chemo or radiation. Uh, stage three is where things, uh, colon and rectal cancers kind of come together again. Uh, stage two is really the outlier. Um, so stage three, uh, <clears throat> the buzzword here is lymph node involvement. Um, and for those, you're going to do chemo, XRT, and surgery. Um, and they, then stage four, colon cancer, uh, again, much like the stage four lung cancer, there's going to be a lot more um, involvement. Uh, Right. Uh, John, thanks for that uh, comment. Um, can't speak to it, but uh, probably would, the boards would probably avoid controversial topics. Uh, so rectal cancer versus colon cancer, just in a couple uh, different slides to say it a different way. <clears throat> uh, stage one, rectal cancer, uh, cut it out. Uh, stage one and two, colon cancer, um, cut it out. No additional therapies. Uh, the important part here uh, is that uh, assessing for microsatellite instability or mismatch repair deficiencies uh, is going to be important in colon cancer. Um, and when you see these, the buzzword for that is uh, Lynch syndrome. So a quarter of these people will have Lynch, Lynch syndrome and you'll need to look elsewhere for uh, other types of cancers. Uh, stage two and three, uh, like we said, um, kind of the same. Uh, you know, this is, this was, uh, I never really understood this, so I'm going to assume someone else doesn't understand this, so I'll be a little uh, vulnerable here, but <clears throat> uh, neoadjuvant chemo. Uh, the word adjuvant, uh, the, the break point for adjuvant is, is surgery. So if you get something before surgery, it's called neoadjuvant. If you get something after surgery, it's called adjuvant. Uh, so some of these treatments, you do neoadjuvant chemo, and then you do surgery, and then you do adjuvant chemo and XRT. Some people get total neoadjuvant, so you get chemo followed by chemo and radiation, and then surgery, uh, and that uh, 
kind of as your stopping point, your bookend. Uh, but just that, uh, just knowing when we talk about adjuvant versus neoadjuvant, uh, that was always confusing to me. Uh, and so just know that surgery is kind of that, that break point. Uh, okay, uh, what the boards want you to know is that 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, uh, uh, is the, the mainstay of treatment for colon cancer. Uh, and we'll uh, talk, um, we'll talk uh, more specifically about um, uh, some chemo regimens that use 5-FU, but uh, and, and know that 5-FU is an infusion, uh, capocytobine is an oral pill, which is a precursor to uh, 5 fluorouracil so your body will convert that to 5-FU so you can kind of think of those as as the same <clears throat> um, other things to uh, think about with uh, rectal cancer and colon cancer uh, is that uh, just tracking it is, um, is, is the same as far as CEA goes, uh, CTs uh, yearly for follow-up. Uh, and then rectal cancer, again, uh, think of it as a little bit more of a, of a, of a baddie in a way and that it needs to be followed a little more closely. Uh, so you get a flex sig or an endoscopic ultrasound every three to six months for two to three years. Uh, whereas colon cancer, you need a colonoscopy colonoscopy um, at year one, four, and then nine uh, after your resection. So a little less uh, invasiveness with uh, C-scopes or with colon cancer. And just one, one brief point I'll yep. uh, mention here is that um, I think one helpful way to think about sort of the difference in the approach so for rectal cancer starting with new adjuvant chemo radiation prior to surgery, that's not something you do for colon cancer, right? Um, but really the reason is because think about the rectum being lower in the pelvis and there are a lot of important surrounding structures. So local control is really, really important. And that's why, you know, um, you know the chemo radiation followed by, so shrink it, make it, you know, um, you know more, more easily taken out by surgery and you always have that radiation piece prior to surgery for local control. Um, so that's really, you know, once again, because of the location of the tumor. Uh, stage four colorectal cancer. Um, again, these are, I don't put these in here because I, I think the boards is going to talk about them, but uh, just uh, sometimes giving names to things make them a little less scary. Uh, so the, the drugs to think about uh, in colorectal cancer, uh, leucovorin is going to help uh, make uh, five fluorouracil stick around a bit longer. Uh, and so uh, leucovorin and 5-FU kind of go together. So that's the fulf of the, uh, of the kind of mnemonic here. Uh, and then your two other drugs that uh, are commonly used are oxaliplatin uh, and aranatecan. Uh, and if you make some sort of combination of those, you can have full fox or full fury or full furinox. Um, and so those are those are common uh, chemos that we see all the time. Uh, also to know that uh, a question stem might say he has three small um, one centimeter tumors in his liver. Uh, what's the next step of treatment? Uh, and so someone who has uh, oligometastatic disease, so uh, if they have less than three tumors in one area, uh, the, the, um, the boards wants you to know that you can just cut those out. Uh, so those can be managed surgically and not uh, necessarily as a, as a stage four um, systemic chemotherapy. Uh, 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 rule. Uh, and then much like uh, the um, the lung cancers, uh, there are many targets uh, for different types of uh, um, uh, immunotherapy and monoclonal antibodies. <clears throat> uh, and so just know uh, that those exist. Uh, and I, I, again, I don't think uh, it'll tell you that there's an, uh, it's positive for VEGF. Uh, what's the next, what's the actual drug that you need to use? Um, but uh, just know that the, those are out there and you might see questions uh, that have uh, bevacizumab in it uh, or cetuximab in it um, and just uh, put them out there just so you're comfortable with, with the words. So I guess I'll jump in here as well. Um, I think when I think about uh, metastatic colon cancer, um, you know, I have a helpful sort of framework for thinking about this as well in terms of rules and exceptions. So um, basically the way I think about it is I think, okay, everyone is gonna get full fox or full fox fear, oh, sorry, full fox or full fury plus or minus BEV. That's what everybody gets, 
right? And it, and it doesn't really matter which one you pick for first. It just different di differs by providers. Okay, and then I think, what are the reasons that you're not gonna get one of those two regimens? So one possibility is you have mismatch repair high, MSI high. In that case, you get PD-1, okay? Um, another um, exception to that would be if you have, um, uh, you know, you look at your RAS mutation status. Okay, so if you're RAS uh, wild type and you have a left-sided colon cancer, then instead you have an EGFR inhibitor along with chemo. Okay. Um, that's because we've learned that left-sided colon cancers with RAS wild type status tend to do better on that kind of therapy. Um, and then I think last but not least, one um, you know, uh, sort of pitfall to avoid is that um, let's say your patient has BRAF mutant status. So it turns out, unlike in melanoma, you don't give BRAF inhibitors first line. So remember that, don't get tripped up by that. It turns out that BRAF mutation status in colon cancer is actually associated with a poor prognosis. So you actually give them um, full Fox Fury first line. It's only in the second line setting that you reach for a BRAF inhibitor. Okay, so once again, just to remember, full Fox or full Fury for everybody, plus or minus BEV, unless you fall into one of those exceptions that I remember, and then you pick a different therapy. There's a question, do we need to know specific chemos for boards? I, I don't know the answer to that question per se. I, I would think that this probably would fall within the realm of what they could test. Um, but uh, for, I don't think they'll ask you to pick between full Fox or full Fury, but I think if they give you, the, you know, this patient is MSI high or not, you know, that they might expect you to pick a different answer. I can share at least from my N of one anecdotally this year, I found the mix up questions um, in oncology to be much more specific and more difficult than the ones that um, were actually presented on boards in August. Sorry, but maybe yeah, it's worth learning. <laughs> All right. Uh, Courtney, feel free to uh, give me the hook whenever, but uh, we're going to go on to one more here. Uh, let's see. I think we covered this uh, nice picture highlighting that Lynch syndrome can do a lot of bad things. Um, and yeah, I think that's good. All right. 57-year-old uh, postmenopausal woman evaluated uh, following the diagnosis of uh, right breast ductal carcinoma in situ after a lumpectomy. Pathologic findings show a grade three ductal carcinoma in situ, spanning two and a half centimeters with negative margins, that is estrogen receptor positive. Uh, lymph nodes were not sampled. Uh, she has received prior breast radiation therapy. She takes no medications. On physical exam, vital signs are normal. There's a healed right breast incision. There are no breast masses or lymphadenopathy. Uh, which of the following is the most appropriate management to decrease the risk of ipsilateral and contralateral breast cancer? One, initiate anastrozole, uh, initiate raloxepine, initiate tamoxifen plus docetaxel, or obtain a 21 gene recurrence scoring test. So we'll go back to the stem here. And Hasib, I want to reach out to you and say, uh, I have to take boards next year as well, uh, after my 10-year certification. And all of these, uh, all of these are new uh, for me too. Uh, so I'm a little, 
uh, nervous as well. So um, know that we're all in this together here. We're at about 60%. I'll give another five seconds or so then close the poll. All right, initiate an astrazole. Uh, and that is, uh, again, these uh, numbers are lining up pretty well. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the big takeaway here is uh, how to treat ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, uh, and so uh, the question stem gave you uh, upfront lumpectomy and radiation. Uh, and then uh, adjuvant endocrine therapy. And then uh, this question was really about which uh, adjuvant therapy are you gonna use? Um, and uh, this is maybe a little nuanced, but I think something important to, to know uh, in that it uh, covers a, a broader topic. But uh, the one takeaway here is that in postmenopausal women uh, who are age less than 60, so kind of in that, I don't know, 15-year uh, zone, um, five years of uh, anastrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor, is better than uh, five years of tamoxifen, which is a estrogen receptor blocker, uh, in reducing breast cancer, uh, but didn't affect mortality. So that was the, that was the trial that uh, it was testing on this. Um, <clears throat> I just know in postmenopausal women, uh, greater than 60, tamoxifen and anastrozole are equivalent. Um, uh, the other answer is raloxifene, uh, similar to tamoxifen, uh, lower clot risk. Uh, so if someone has a history of clots, you might reach for this uh, as a uh, estrogen receptor blocker. Uh, you don't need to use chemo uh, in ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, and then again, the 21 gene score is used for uh, invasive ER positive cancers to figure out if adjuvant chemo should be given uh, to anti-estrogen therapy. Uh, so I really didn't understand this very well until I saw this chart and I said, oh, thank you MixUp for including this chart. Uh, this is very helpful. Um, so tamoxifen and raloxifene again, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators. Uh, and exemestane and anastrozole are going to be the two that you see on boards, uh, or at least the ones that are covered in MixUp, <clears throat> that are going to be your aromatase inhibitors. Uh, and again, pointing out the difference between raloxifene and tamoxifen, uh, there is much lower uh, risk of vascular events, particularly DVTs um, and PEs in uh, the raloxifene group versus tamoxifen. Uh, and uh, this is a, a big uh, category that uh, you'll have to look at as a buzzword uh, is in premenopausal versus postmenopausal women. Uh, so premenopausal women uh, to uh, prevent um, uh, breast cancer, um, tamoxifen is uh, is the the go-to, um, and then. Uh, Exemestane and anastrozole aromatase inhibitors really have no role uh, in premenopausal women uh, and can be used. Um, uh, so what, I know we're coming toward the end of our time. Oh, yeah, sure. I think one point I'll um, highlight about this table is that um, this here is for primary chemo prevention for breast cancer. So right. we're talking about women or, uh, with high risk, like a high five-year risk for developing invasive breast cancer. So there are actually tools to help you. And there's different definitions depending on what society you talk to, but there are some general rules that can help you with calculating this. Um, so for example, if you get thoracic radiation before age 30, if you have a history of LCIS, or if you have a calculated risk that's greater than 3% in five years, then you, know, then you think about these kinds of therapies know that for those risk calculators, it excludes patients with history of DCIS. So if you have a history of DCIS, those calculations don't apply to you. The other really great point that um, I'll just echo from Adam here is that the choice of what agent is really determined by the side effect profile at the end of the day in a very individualized discussion with the patient. So for the purposes of the test, you know, um, that may be an, an area that will help you distinguish between which answer to pick. Great. 
great. Uh, so I think we thank you for, for pointing out uh, the difference uh, in primary chemo prevention. So the first uh, question stem was how do you manage uh, DCIS uh, after lumpectomy uh, and radiation um, in pre versus postmenopausal women? And then this uh, second slide is uh, a bonus, if you will, uh, for high risk patients. So uh, thank you, Dr. Seng, for, for pointing that out. Um, let's see. I think we are, I think we're at time. Am I wrong? You're correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, any further questions in the chat? Uh, anything? Um, again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sang and, uh, Courtney and, you all for, for having me today. And um, again, we're, we're 26 through 43 slides that I made. So if, if you want uh, additional slides, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, again, um, uh, adam.johnson6 at va.gov. Um, and uh, I, I can uh, pass those on to you. So yeah, and I'd like to echo that. You know, thank you. Um, thank you all for participating this more th morning. And thank you, Dr. Johnson, for this wonderful presentation. And if anyone has interest in talking more about uh, lung cancer or interest in research or whatnot, please don't hesitate to reach out and I'd love to talk to you more. Great. Well, thank you both so much for being here and uh, sharing your wisdom and helping us work through some of the nuances of these questions. Um, for everyone else, we'll take a seven minute break now and come back together at 9.55. <laughs>